Welcome everybody and uh, thank you for connecting today for this webinar. I'm Arianna Traviglia and I'm the coordinator of the Center for Cultural Heritage Technology, one of the 11 centers of IIT. I have the pleasure today to introduce uh, a seminar uh, which is a part of a series of webinar titled Science in the Time of COVID organized by the IIT alumni office and open to everybody. A series that aims to uh, analyze the impact of a COVID-19 pandemic on science from different point of view. With this uh, initiative, we hope to provide some food for thoughts for the IIT community and beyond the scientific community in, in general, which is facing quite a difficult period that has led to uh, quite important changes, both in the way in which we interact with each other and in the way we think about our life and uh, our work. Uh, the topic of today is in part different from the other seminars of this series uh, as we are going to look at the pandemic from the point of view of history. It, a wonderful team of, of scholars and friends that uh, we are hosting today is going to bridge science and history offering as a unique historical political view, historical political insights on the COVID-19 pandemic with a presentation titled Political Epistemology of Pandemic and Management. And being myself a scholar with a transdisciplinary background, I think this is uh, really a fantastic opportunity for all of us all connected to cross contaminate the way we look at it is a historical moment, looking at it uh, through the eyes of our guest. I would like to introduce them. I would like to introduce uh, this scholar that will lead us in this fascinating travel across the past. Uh, they are Pietro Modeo, a cultural historians of science and a professor of historical epistemology at the Foscari University of Venice. Flavio D'Abramo, a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and Charles Wolf, a researcher at the Department of Philosophy and Cultural Heritage of Kafuskari University of Venice. Pietro Modeo will first introduce the collective political epistemological approach of this team. Fabio D'Abramo will then discuss the entanglements of medical expertise, economic interest and the surveillance politics of the past. And at the end, Charles Wolf will address the limitation entailed in the Italian theories biopolitics. I will moderate uh, the event and I have a gentle reminder uh, to all the audience. We will have a Q&A space which will follow the last presentation. And uh, this will be dedicated to anyone interested in having more information from the speakers and about today's discussion. I would like to encourage all the audience to use the side panel that is located uh, at the right hand side of the screen uh, to send your questions about the during the talk or at the end of it, and we will select uh, the most engaging ones and the ones that will be read at the end and we'll, we'll be listening to the answer from our speakers. There is also an opportunity to send them toward the end of the event and we will count on the courtesy of our guests today to answer them uh, later on. Now we no more delay, it is my pleasure to leave the stage to our guests. So I would like um, um, to welcome all three of our speakers and introduce the first speaker, Pietro Modeo. Pietro, the stage is yours. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for the, the kind words of introduction, Arianna. I'm very thankful to the IIT, the Italian Institute for Technology, for, for this invitation. I, as you said, I represent, and me, me and the other colleagues presenting today are part of a, of a larger group. Therefore, I'd like also to thank those who were engaged in the, the preparation of this talk and are not speaking, Gerardo Yenna and Giulia Gandolfi in particular. So when I was invited to, to this speech, uh, Peach, I was uh, thrilled and uh, and challenged at the same time, uh, being, as you said, the cultural historian of 
science, who works on cosmology and the social settings of the science of the past, somebody who is interested in the political settings of the science of yesterday and today, uh, I was wondering whether I could contribute to this uh, series of talks. Um, but then discussing also with the colleagues who are here, we thought that this would be a perfect case of pandemics management would be a perfect case to address um, or to present uh, our own approach, the main questions we have in mind when we speak about uh, what we label as political epistemology. I will say a few words of introduction to our political historical approach to um, to um, science. But first of all, you have here a nice image of uh, Venice from the 16th century. And this, this is, so to say, the image with which I would like to start our uh, reflection today to share ideas with you, uh, starting from, from Venice. Uh, why Venice? For many reasons. Uh, some are obvious to many of us. Venice has been uh, and probably is still symbolically the paradigm of health management in uh, in modernity. Here you see the lagoon, the island of Venice, or the main island, the main body of the city at the center, and I mark with red, red dots the, so to say, the, the, the places that constituted the, uh, the main instruments of the health system, health management of Venice from the Middle Ages throughout the, uh, the early modernity. And I use this image to stress immediately that geography, the topography of the city is uh, highly representative of, uh, of, an, of two issues, I would say, that are very important for us. Uh, to look at epidemics from the viewpoint of economic history, from the viewpoint of uh, political history. And if you look at the lagoon, the water has always been, so to say, the walls of the city um, of Venice and the islands, those I marked, were uh, instruments of of filtering the fence and let me say from the inception uh, of surveillance, uh, it was the places where um, not only uh, sick people were sent or were quarantined, but it was also the place where uh, where traders, ships were could be stopped for uh, for health reasons. And there is an there was and for long uh, for long time and centuries. Uh, an ongoing diplomatic uh, life going on, information about dangerous places uh, for plague were mapped through uh, through um, through uh, accurate systems of gathering information, and there was a dimension of local social control as well. So you had though the the San Lazzaro Island uh, as the place where uh, where people affected by uh, leprosy were. Uh, confined the Lazzaretto Vecchio, the place for uh, the first uh, first Lazzaretto, so to say, for plague, where um, where uh, people were sent from the 15th century onwards. The Lazzaretto Nuovo, which you can see a bit further on, for quarantine, for you know the place where ships were stopped, and San Servolo, the 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 sanitarium, the island for for the mental ill people. So you see here. Uh, um, a topography of a surveillance system, which is an health system, and it is a system of uh, which is closely interconnected with the economic interests of a city that was uh, widely, um, widely uh, connected with uh, with the world of trade and commerce. So next slide, please. This is the overview of our talk. Um, uh, I think that Ariana already gave us a nice overview. I will start with an introduction to uh, what we mean by political epistemology, what are the questions um, that we have in mind, what are the problems we are addressing. Uh, then Flavio Abramo will propose a historical critical perspective on epidemics. We look at the biopolitical discourse and then we'll come to some concluding remarks by myself. Next slide. Political epistemology uh, is um, our, let's say, transdisciplinary approach to uh, to science, a reflection on science that is that brings together uh, the history of science, especially the cultural and the social history of science, uh, the philosophy of science, and political theory. These are the three axes of our. Approach. By that we mean, and you can show the next slide, please, 
um, we mean to address three entangled problems. Um, the question of, of the roots of science, the origins, the genesis of science and its development, the question of validity, which has to do with the method and truth criteria of science and eventually the functions um, of science. Uh, we look at all these problems, which are problems in history and philosophy of science, as well as politics of science. If you look at the problem of, of the functions, the material transformative ones, as well as the cultural ones, including uh, ideological uses of science as problems that are deeply um, social and political. We look at the social context of the material uh, genesis and development of science, the problems of, um, of the values that are always at stake when we have to do with validity and the interests that are also at play in matters of science. And eventually, uh, when we speak about the problem of functions, we have in mind uh, the science and technology as a transformative force, as well as uh, science as a tool of, uh, of uh, consensus creation. So if you can switch to the next slide. So given the context of today's talk, I thought it's also um, important to stress the importance of technology and the history of technology in our reflection. Uh, we rely on, uh, on, on well-established scholarship uh, in the use and the, and the ways to think of technology and especially the practical dimension that is uh, embodied in the use of technologies as one of the most important sources of modern science, science in general, its codification. Uh, there has been um, an established tradition of scholarship that has looked, for instance, at mechanics as uh, the science of machine as the as the realm out of which uh, the science of mechanics and modern physics could be um, could be developed. Uh, but we also look at technology as um, from the viewpoint, perhaps a bit more metaphorical, uh, of the te technologies of um, of uh, social order and consensus making. We can say the technology of subjectivation, perhaps. Uh, we mean by that, uh, so you can see the assembly line by, uh, by Ford, uh, which was created in the early 20th century according to the, to the guidelines of uh, Taylor's scientific management. So the techniques of management developed by, um, by Taylor are very important as they were taken as a case to reflect on, on the psychology and also the, soci the sociology and the cultural dimensions of uh, technological transformations uh, also in relation to, uh, to society in, uh, in general. And we also think of, um, of Foucault's uh, technologies of the self, again, relation between technological aspects and, and cognitive, psychological ones, and the problem of, so to say, the, the politics of life, the biopolitics on which we will say more uh, later on. Uh, the next slide shows a sort of pentagon of problems that we'd like to stress as crucial for today's reflection on science, technology and science. Health is very high in the the agenda of the important topics, uh, but we think, and we are not alone in that, uh, that it is closely connected with a set of other um, problems of today's scientific world. Uh, first of all, environment, environment and health as two issues that have been often uh, put together, the problem of IT, information circulation, and also uh, you know, the algorithmization of our society pro with problems of surveillance and work organization. All of this is a sort of, of prism of topics uh, which uh, we'd like to, um, to think together against the background of, of the societal settings uh, we live in, bringing in the political and economic um, dimensions. Um, I have no time to un to develop these ideas further, but this is just the stage uh, for our um, for for our work. Uh, just two suggestions, two readings of scholars who have been trying to put together these dimensions in recent works, especially health and environment. There is a recent book, book 2020, by Andreas Malm, the author of Fossil Capital, um, that is devoted to uh, coronavirus and climate, the climate crisis. Just 
published. And another important book to us uh, is a book by um, by uh, the Calcutta Research Group in, in India. It's a politically motivated research group that just edited a book about borders uh, of an epidemic. That's the title. It's about COVID-19 and migration workers. Uh, I'll show you a few pictures later on the problems of, um, of migration and COVID in today's India. But with this, I pass the word to the next speaker, Flavio, to present us more uh, history. Flavio, we can't hear you. Sorry for the lack of voice. <laughs> now there is a bit more voice. The voice is yours now. Yeah, thanks. First of all, thanks for the to the Italian Institute of Technology, Foscari, and Pietro Daniele Modeo for having organized this. Uh, what you will be hearing today, it's in part the result of a collaboration between uh, colleagues from Berlin and Kafoskari, from Berlin, Maria Rentezzi, Roberto Lalli, and Verena Brown, and uh, all the others from Kafoskari you, you have already uh, heard by Pietro. Uh, slide. Well, since um, the beginning of time, humans have experienced a series of contagious diseases such as plague, smallpox, HIV, AIDS, or the great influenza of 1918 with dramatic health results. The quarantine may be one of the oldest administrative measures to counter the plague and other infectious diseases was uh, ideated between 1384 and 1465 when the Sanitary Council of Venice, the most important commercial port that has changed cargos with the Levant, and the nearby Republic of Ragusa, which is today Dubrovnik, established the isolation of infected ships for 40 days. A slide, please. In the management of epidemics, quarantine was a means to address outbreaks by isolating individuals and communities. The Lazzaretto of Venice uh, that you see here in the, in the slide was created about 600 years ago in 1423 as an island hospital for the confinement of all those who contracted plague. The first lazaretto was the place in which individuals with plague were detained in a sort of ghost city of deformed and sick people ruled by clerics. Within a few decades in 1468, a second island today known was deputed to serve as a place of hope for those who luckily recovered and could be transferred to the to this next station for their convales convalescence slide. The new Lazzaretto was the beauty to quarantine those suspected to be infected or who had been in contact with sick people as well. Moreover, it became a place for the quarantine of vessels, goods and people who entered the lagoon from countries allegedly affected by plague and other contagious ills. A magistrato alla sanità was instituted after the plague of 1485 and its extensive and dramatic spread at a slow but steady pace through the years and centuries. It even became an institution that kept track of the movements of people, watched over the poor and prostitutes, and it was assumed that people's circulation misery and sexuality favored the spreading of the diseases. The institution developed a complex intelligent network, as Pedro was uh, reminding us, in order to collect information about diseases in other countries. Slide. Such information could be used for commercial battles and international politics too. For instance, when in 15th century, the Republic of Ragusa quarantined ships from Venice as plague was taking over the city, Venice later responded by blocking ships from Ragusa in retaliation. Quarantine was therefore the main means to address epidemics, as well as a means of war that went along the making of European nation states. 
The commerce managed by the Dutch with the East and West Indies caused in 1663 the appearance of the plague in Amsterdam. By 1664, the plague killed over 35,000 people in Amsterdam. And England, Sweden and Denmark, which competed with the Netherlands for the access to the Levant and Asia markets, imposed extremely long and sometimes unjustified quarantine on Dutch vessel, vessels. The Dutch responded with an embargo imposed on English ships. Nevertheless, the connivence between English merchants, Dutch traders and Ebor officials allowed the smuggling of goods into England and sometimes Dutch captains were discovered breaking the quarantine in English cities. Slide. By analyzing the plague epidemic that took place in Marseille in 1720, French historian Jean-Pierre Papon highlighted the role of the merchants who decided when to hand the administrative measures of lockdown and sanitation to eventually suggest that since the functioning of health board is challenged by particular interests, it would be advisable to avoid a committee entirely composed by merchants. In 1789, the use of quarantine for a Venetian ship commissioned by the Tunisian reign of Hamouda Bey al Husani to carry a cargo from Alexandria to Tunis led even to war. Once the cargo got infected with plague and quarantined in Malta, the gods within were destroyed. The denied Tunisian request of compensation steered Tunisian corsair ships to sail towards Venetian vessels to confiscate their cargoes. In retaliation, Venetian warships bombed La Goulette and the coastal cities of Sousse and Sfax. After a few days of war, the two governments found an agreement and luckily reopened their commercial relationships. Slide. During the 15th and 19th century, trade began to play such a key role that the most important commercial ports of the Mediterranean Sea, by following the Venice model, equipped themselves with health boards and sanitary institutions to quarantine ships, goods and crews in lazaretos. Quarantine was born and extensively used as an administrative measure to save the trade of European powers and their wealthiest population from the contagion spread across maritime trade routes. Slide. The cholera pandemic of 1817 was the first of six cholera outbreaks between 1817 and 1917. It exploded in British India and spread through Russia, China and the Middle East across the West Africa. In India alone, it is estimated that one to two million people died. The disease, the disease created and, and aggravated social issues. Slide. In Russia, the poor protested quarantine restrictions that hindered their ability to work and survive. In 1831, for example, the popular revolt, which took place in the Russian temple of administrative area against the quarantine caused 2,300 deaths. And it required troops, which until 1832, 33, sorry, for two years then, militarized the area to quash the uprisings. By 1832, during the second cholera pandemic of the 19th century, the disease had traveled across Russia to Western Europe and England and had reached the Americas. Slide. Paris, like many other cities in Europe, here you can see a picture from the cholera pandemic in Palermo, was growing fast at that time, so fast actually that it outpaced its administrative capacities and could literally not bury its death. Cholera spread especially easily in the crowded and the deprived parts of the city where the poorer residents lived. Pandemic have a significant impact on political system and economies, and gradually scientific advancements after offered a better understanding of cholera. Slide. In 1849, physician John Snow hypothesized that the cholera outbreak had microbial origins. He also inferred that microbes spread via the sewage system, which leaking into the aqueducts 
clean drinking water. Um, form the map you can see here in the picture slide. In 1845, Italian microscopist Filippo Pacini identified the microscopic vibrio responsible for what was then called ageric cholera. He realized that the contagion needed an organic living substance in order to be able to cause, reproduce and spread the disease. As highlighted by historian of science Erwin Ackernecht, at the time of Pacinian's no contagion, the idea that a disease spread through contact or, or proximity among individuals was countered at least by two subjects, namely liberal powers who, despite the, the dramatic effects of cholera pandemics, wanted to keep global, global trade going on, as well as by all those who wanted to counter the symbolic power of quarantine, often used by officials and governments to segregate minorities, such as the poor, or quarantine used as a means of war. Before the scientific discoveries of Filippo Pacini, John Snow, Louis Pasteur, uh, Robert Koch, the physicians and medical institutions of uh, Europe countering the theory of contagion and the related practice, such as the quarantine, represented the majority among all the scientific communities. After the scientific observations that confirmed the presence of living transmissible entities causing the spread of disease, the anti-contagion is suddenly declined. And in a few decades, sanitary institutions started to develop their interventions based on the new germ theory, for instance, new kinds of diagnostics. Slide. Scientists and diplomats joined forces during the pandemics in order to coordinate responses to cholera across country borders. Between 1851 and 1938, a series of 14 conferences known as the International Sanitary Conferences took place across Europe and the United States. Each country was represented by a diplomat and a physician. The goal was to standardize international quarantine regulations and, nego and negotiate preventive measures, which eventually affected not only health policies, but reformed national economies and destabilized political systems. Indeed, the spread of contagious diseases through commercial routes was not the only reason to initiate such international health coordination. The misuse of quarantine undertaken during the previous centuries as a means of foreign policy and weapon of war was recognized in the 19th century as an issue to solve through so-called health diplomacy. Undoubtedly, highlights global historian Mark Harrison, the emergence of international sanitary coordination lies, in part, in the misuse of mar maritime quarantine with the deliberate and consequent disruption of commerce and the hunger of merchants and their political allies. When, problem when the problems caused by epidemics and the improper use of quarantine added to the 1831 Egyptian invasion of the Ottoman province of Syria, which posed a direct threat to British and French commerce, the European powers played the new diplomatic card. Slide. Interestingly, interestingly the conveners of the first sanitary conferences, in line with the anti-contagionist beliefs of the time, refuted the theory of contagion and, and indicated the quarantine as a waste of time. This, in turn, had many effects. For example, it has prevented the national administration of colonial powers from recognizing Vibrio cholera leaking from the sewers in aqueducts and irrigation canals as the main cause of epidemics. Instead, the British colonial administrations in India attributed the main cause of, chol of the cholera epidemics to the unhygienic habits of the Indian people, and in so doing, avoided tackling the material and logistic aspects of a structural reform of aqueducts and irrigation canals. While scientists continued their efforts to fully describe the disease, diplomats strengthened identification and documentation measures with visas, sanitary passports and bills of health. These measures allowed border crossing by travelers and vehicles to be tracked. Thus, the health diplomacy of 19th century often considered 
health issues caused by epidemics as a function of the most influential power's commercial interests. This power relation translated in a polarization emer emerged during the first sanitary conferences, one that discriminated which places and peoples were the aptest for undertaking quarantine. The discrimination concerned alleged European exceptionalism versus the social, political and medical conditions of Asian and Muslim, Muslim countries. At the 1874 Vienna Conference, the travelers departing from India, the epicenter of the cholera epidemic, were obliged to undertake quarantine in Asia. Similarly, Muslim and Arab pilgrims were indicated as more susceptible to contagion than European peoples, and therefore in need of being quarantined in their home countries, while European powers liberalized the use of quarantine across European states. Slide. The East and Middle East were therefore considered as, as sanitary buffer zones to prevent an alleged passage of disease from the, uh, the Orient. These sanitary administrative buffer zones have been implemented through an international telegraph-based reporting system of contagion disease which was considered jointly by the delegates of the 1893 Dresden Conference and applied in Europe after the 1894 Paris Conference. In the time, the United States and countries in Europe made major health and sanitation reforms in their respective countries and struggled to deal with the resulting social agitation. Cholera proved then that nations had to be collaborate on an international level if they were going to effectively address infectious disease. Thus, several international health organizations were established before the First World War, but only after the end of the war in 1922, the League of Nations was formed as the world's first intergovernmental organization with its own health committee and health section. Slide. In 1948, the WHO, the World Health Organization, was established as one of the earliest specialized agencies of the United Nations. The United Nations started with 55 member states and today represents 194 states and two associate members. According to the WHO Assembly, the World, open quote, the World Health Organization is by its nature a technical organization whose objective is the attainment by all peoples of the highest possible level of health, end quote. And whose goal is to ensure health for everybody globally. The WHO represents itself a technical and apolitical, an organization that welcomes membership universally. Accordingly, staff members are considered, open quote, international civil servants, end quote, with no national responsibilities and no national attachments. And the special focus of, uh, of the organization is on epidemic diseases. During the Cold War, the organization attained a global leadership status in matters of health and disease, but it also suffered from Cold War tensions between the United States and the socialist countries. For instance, during the first years of the WHO, Countries of Eastern Europe, such as Poland, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia, were blocked from the Americans to develop their own production of penicillin. When in 1949, Joseph Ployer, Czechoslovak health minister and Roman Catholic priest asked at the World Health Assembly why the Americans didn't deliver the remaining machines brought by Czechoslovak government to start their penicillin production, and referring explicitly to the contract signed by both the parties, the American delegate answered, uh, open quote, contract, no contract, you turn socialist, you get nothing, end quote. As Ployer has written, open quote, the president of the WHO assembly then put the Czechoslovak question to vote. And apart from the five yes votes of the socialist countries present, the issue was overruled, overruled ruled by the majority. The vassals voted well. It was a real American decision. I wouldn't have thought 
that professional issues. What's more, a question of health can be distorted so under political duress." End quote. The American delegate Len Leonard Andrew Shield, Sergeant General, referred to it and dismissed the claim by stating that the equipment in question was not necessary for the production of penicillin. After about two years from the inception of the WHO in 1948, one by one, Albania, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, Czechoslovakia and Poland left the international agency and mainly because of the lack of access to scientific discoveries. Uh, can you please stop the slides? Throughout the post-war years, the WHO decisively shaped the dissemination of medical knowledge uh, practices, technologies, and materials across the globe. The WHO standardized therapies for common diseases, produce procedures of drug approval, and dealt data collection processes. For example, the WHO has facilitated the international use of antibiotics and vaccines, and has tried to eradicate epidemics such as syphilis, smallpox, and polio. Yet, it lacks an explicit authority to enforce its recommendations. Given that the WHO is the result of strong diplomatic negotiations, it is far from being, being just an apolitical and technical organization. Instead, the WHO has been a product of the global political, social and economic context throughout its history. The most influential member states push for their own interests and mobilize their diplomatic channels within the organization to achieve their goals. The World Health, uh, some, uh, the World Health Summit uh, of this year, in a panel focus on multilateral health partnership, veterinarian and head of the Robert Koch Institute in Berlin, Lothar Wieler, asked how to realize a system of governance in which the public trusts health and research institutions and where the country that encountered the SARS-CoV-2 pathogen for the first time might give information on it without being penalized with, for instance, with travel restrictions. The distrust of the, uh, of the national and international public derives from the history of international sanitary institutions and the discriminations, the discriminations they have produced during time. We can ent interpret Lodar's question as the need of, our, of organ, organizing a system of global epidemiological surveillance outside the hegemonic influence that certain governments exert on global health. The first step to address Lothar, Lothar's question consists in rejecting the allegedly technical and apolitical nature of institutions such as the WHO by looking at their history. There is an undeniable historical, imperial and colonial load of international health or institutions such as the WHO. Indeed, medical and sanitary issues are, since always, main foci of concern and politics and diplomacy are the two spheres that during the last two centuries have had a major role to prioritize, overlook or hinder programs of sanitary intervention. An ethics of care can benefit from an historically informed perspective on science, society and international health organizations. A historically informed ethics of care shows that the biological characteristics of all the outbreaks take a shape together with the social, geopolitical, cultural and economic factors and that the COVID-19 pandemic does not represent an exception. And with this, I pass the floor to Char. Okay. Thank you, Flavio. Thank you to the organizers, to Pietro Modeo for inviting me to participate in this excellent group initiative. So I, I see that there are questions in the Q&A, but I guess the organizers maybe want us to wait till we've finished all of our components of the presentation before we get to the questions. Anyway, you you let us know. Um, let's see. Let me go to my text. 
so, and I acknowledge the co-authoring of uh, Julia Gandolfi in this, this part of our work here. So we turn now to a more theoretical dimension of these notions, not the notion of pandemic or epidemic per se, or public health, uh, like in uh, Flavio's discussion, but the reflection on what it means to manage life itself. And you might say managing life itself is what these philosophers mean in recent decades when they talk about biopolitics. Biopolitics is a peculiar, slippery, contested term first coined by Michel Foucault in lectures at the Collège de France in the 1970s, and then given new life in a more, if I may say so, more irrationalist, but also more public usage by the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben and other thinkers in Agamben circle in recent years. Part of the difficulty with the term biopolitics is that it is both descriptive and prescriptive, or both empirical and normative. In other words, the term describes a state of affairs, actually different possible states of affairs, in which governments rule over life. This could be the fact that there are public health bureaucracies. It could be the management of various medical conditions, the emergence of biotech as a research and investment area, but also a more top-down government mandated area. These are all cases of biopolitics in the simpler descriptive sense. A less immediately relevant in our current situation of pandemic, but also crucial in the contemporary biopolitical context, is an idea like biocapital. For example, someone with a rare genetic disorder can be useful to drug companies. The human body can be used in profit making terms in a new way. So, slide. Thanks. The more prescriptive, so that was the more descriptive side. On the more prescriptive or normative sense of biopolitics is when one of these thinkers denounces the state for disciplinary power over the body, or bodies in the plural. And of course, this has come into very vivid recent focus with the pandemic where people protest against this idea that there is a kind of biological control of who they are. But this is, of course, not new. First of all, you have just heard an in-depth historical analysis from Flavio that it's, it's by no means a new phenomenon. But as a concept, this sense of biopolitics covers different phenomena. It could be the management, and I put that in quotes, the management of refugees, to the confinement of populations viewed as literally contagious. And a very sad and vivid example of where the biological or medical and the political are very mixed is Fidel Castro's confining of HIV positive individuals in concentration camps in Cuba in the 1980s. I mean, that's the kind of moment where people want to think about biopolitics as a sort of problematic category. Um, this is probably not the place to speak in detail about Foucault versus Agamben in, in their ideas of this topic, but Foucault's idea is a bit, is much more historically and socially contextualized. And there is a notion of biopower, which exerts itself on populations like sanitary measures, and then there is a kind of resistance. Our own bodies, our persons can have a capacity for resistance. In Agamben, it becomes a constant feature of the civilized world from the ancient Greeks onward. Quote, quoting Agamben, Western politics is a biopolitics from the very beginning. And in this shift towards the prescriptive with Agamben, all of society becomes defined in terms of inner and outer. I quote Agamben one more time from his famous book, Homo Sacer. The decisive fact is that together with the process by which the exception everywhere becomes the rule, the realm of bare life, originally situated at the margins of the political order, gradually begins to coincide with the political realm and exclusion and inclusion outside and inside, bios and zoe, de jure and de factus, enter into a zone of irreducible indistinction. And here, and I'm in case it's not clear to you, I or we are critical of this dimension of his thought. Throughout his work and public editorials, at least since the 90s, Agamben has used the camp 
Lager concept in a generalized ahistorical way. His book on Auschwitz and the more philosophical background for the Auschwitz book in Homo Sacer. Personally, I remember in 2002, he wrote a very widely translated editorial in a, came out in many of the big European newspapers, arguing that the then projected constitution for the EU was like Auschwitz because it was total control over life. And if you fast forward to March 2020, he is saying the same thing about confinement in a time of COVID-19. It's the sort of Auschwitz, Auschwitz, Auschwitz from Agamben. And I quote him, it is clear that ever since Homo sapiens first appeared, there have been apparatuses, by which he means something like techniques, technologies, uh, arrangements of discipline. But we could say that today there is not even a single instant in which the life of individuals is not modeled, contaminated, or controlled by some apparatus. And at the bottom of the same slide, I have this phrase. It seems to me, to borrow a phrase from um, Catherine Mills, that we could say that the so-called politics of life in Agamben is really a politics of death. It's not a biopolitics, but a thanatopolitics. Um, trying to be a bit critical and a bit reflective about this idea that this kind of Kafkaesque or fascistic figure of the state is always in control and always sort of looming down on us. In reaction to that kind of focus in Agamben, Foucault's reflections are more subtle because he also connects this topic to the emergence of modern liberalism. And so to put in very concrete terms, bio forms of power today are not just about the sovereign or the head of state. The boss of a big biotech firm also has biopower. So there is a sense in which to focus exclusively on the state is maybe uh, sometimes politically or intellectually important, but can become a kind of obsession. Um, I mentioned the slide. I, before concluding, mention um, this, well, small monument of bad taste coming from the supposedly critical leftist corner of the world of theory, including Agamben. Here you have an example. This is a book that came out in the hottest months of the, you know, the early spring in our, our pandemic. With this kind of strange apocalyptic, but also comfortable self-fulfilling prophecies of um, denunciation of state practices. And to conclude, Agamben and thinkers close to him, like Roberto Esposito, who's a professor at the Scuola Normale in Pisa, so not a minor figure in Italian intellectual life. In their reflections on biopolitics, they seem to be good instances for our time of what Theodor Adorno called, referring to Heidegger, the jargon of authenticity, which is to say a language that seems a kind of mystical language of raw, pure experience in which it's very hard to develop reflected social and political critique. And um, concludes slide with uh, these, I think, powerful, but indeed a bit slippery also, words from the, the great thinker Walter Benjamin in an essay called Critique of Violence. So I, I read it. It might be well worthwhile to track down the origin of the dogma of the sacredness of life. Perhaps, indeed, probably it is relatively recent, the last mistaken attempt of the weakened Western tradition to seek the saint it has lost in cosmological impenetrability. Now, this is a quotation that is used by Agamben and others in his circle, but it seems to me that you could take it the other way to say, People who want to fight battles on a mystical or messianic level about biopolitics are in the last phase of denial that something like secularization is just an unescapable um, march on, you know, an unescapable development. But I acknowledge that this quote can be taken in different ways. So thank you. And I hand over to Pietro for a conclusion. So thank you, Flavio. Thank you, Shar. Um, a few concluding remarks. 
uh, basically three. Um, so next slide uh, summarizes uh, them. <clears throat> the first one uh, is directly connected with the problem of, of the management of life and bi biopolitics that has just been addressed. Um, as a group, we, um, we, we see the connection of politics and health management as a crucial issue. Uh, but we would refrain uh, from uh, from such excesses as the biologization of political theory, something that has been occurring for a while. So to treat political theories as a matter of, of uh, let's say, of a biologized theory on the one hand. On the other hand, um, there can be non-naturalization of um, or apostatization of biomedicine. So science, medicine, technology, have a history, so we cannot just abstract them, make of them something absolute, uh, atemporal, and then use it for the purposes of, of specific theories and analysis. So the approach that we propose instead is one that looks, let's say in more very general terms, that looks at, at, um, at the political economy uh, of science, in which economy should be understood in a very uh, broad sense so problems like surveillance and geopolitics that have been taken uh, as the models of modern politics and political theory for us are not the models are sort of side effects or the other side of um, of modern forms of politics and i think that flavio showed in a very uh, clear manner that uh, measures like quarantines or uh, health systems that were developed from Venice uh, in the late Middle Ages onwards um, have been, uh, so to say, the the cost and also the the uh, the, the, the cost of uh, a commercial economic life uh, that was unfolding with uh, with a lot of political and economic resonances. So be it the commercial ties in the Mediterranean basin of Venice in late Middle Ages and uh, later on, be it colonialism, be it the globalized uh, neoliberal free market society we live in, um, measures of sanity are not just uh, uh, an abstract medical issue, but are uh, problems with, uh, with, um, with deep political and economic roots. This is the first point. Uh, the second point is um, we want to make is rather a call, um, a call to uh, to more commitment and responsibility and awareness of the commitment of responsibility that is necessary by scientists, technologies, as experts that are not just pure experts like those we've been discussing in historical cases, but um, as intellectuals, intellectuals with uh, and citizens with. Um, with responsibilities, duties, and commitments. Uh, this also has to do with the necessity of a critical reflection on the political uses of science, and also, you know, even in critic in times of crisis, the the need to um, to uh, to make use of of reflection of of the uses, the function, even the misuses of science like the, the old new problem of the relation between expertise and democracy, the problem of technocracy, the problem of uh, the uses of science and technology for the construction of consensus and so on. So these are crucial questions that we have to raise today and are still uh, and are still very high in the political uh, agenda of the day. Uh, we'd also like to point to another issue that is very relevant to us. Uh, that is the problem of what we write here in the slide, the problem of an emancipated science and uh, technology. Um, we have to use imagination and think what a science and technology can be and should be uh, freed of or um, that reflects on economic ties, interests, political interests, and even aspects of work like the alienation of scientific work by scientific workers. These are all issues that are uh, that we think are connected with the question about the science and technology of tomorrow. And eventually the issue, the third point uh, in the slide, uh, the problem of pandemics, uh, which we see as uh, not just um, pandemics management, not just as a technical, but 
just to repeat once more, a political problem. And in the next couple of slides, I will just briefly point to some instances of, uh, of the immediate political cultural impact of uh, today's uh, management. The first one, um, just to, to, to make us reflect, is the cultural lapses that we encounter every day so much that it has passed unreflected at some point. The problem of, uh, of social distancing. We are always reminded uh, that we have to keep social distance, but actually we, are, we should keep physical distance. There is a, a, a deep difference between the two. And it's not just linguistic, it's political and cultural. So even the, the most banal words uh, are sort of, or can become sort of cultural lapses that in the end uh, cover or foster certain practices uh, like, and that's the next slide, um, the re-emergence of, uh, of, you know, of the ghosts of caste, race, discrimination, marginalization. Look at this picture uh, of cases that were denounced in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, migrant workers that had to flee from the production centers of the north, where production was stopped due to coronavirus, had to migrate in millions, the, the biggest migration phenomenon in the subcontinent since the, the 40s, uh, that were treated in the way you, you can see in order to be disinfected. And you see again, you know, the problem of, of real social distancing. So the physical distancing becoming back, you know, physical distancing as in uh, in, in the caste system. And the next slide, the, the last one, is taken from, uh, from Politically Maths, a collective in India who's been working hard on denouncing and reflecting the entanglements of, uh, of science and society in the present uh, predicament. And I think this image speaks by itself and points to a sort of uh, the sort of problems we, we think we need to think always when we speak about uh, about numbers. Numbers are not just numbers, but are embedded in, in the social, economical, political reality. We've been trying to historicize. And that's the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to Pietro Modeo, to Flavio D'Abramo and Charles Wolf for this fascinating travel uh, across history and politics of, of the pandemics. And some of the topics that we have heard are actually quite timely and you made this point uh, quite clear and um, it, this clarifies very well how current pandemic and possibly pandemics of the future can be really informed by, by history because we have seen many of the partners you have been discussing are the same type of partners we are seeing, um, we are witnessing these uh, these days. And uh, as a citizen of, of Venice, I was very interested, of course, to hear about the centrality of Venice, uh, my city, in the past, in the containment of uh, pandemic pandemics since uh, since the Middle Ages. And through all these um, uh, historical travel that we did. Um, uh, thanks to you. We have seen also how things have been changing across the years, but how certain uh, certain behavior, let's say, has not changed much because we are seeing um, similar uh, partners uh, nowadays. Um, it was personally uh, quite uh, amazing to hear about uh, the connections between pandemics uh, and pandemic measures and politics. I have never uh, thought about this topic in, in, in this way before. And um, it was particularly uh, strong uh, when you were speaking about the confinement of a specific groups of people. And this clearly holds significant parallels to what is uh, happening in 2020, especially especially in Italy. So uh, it was it was extremely interesting uh, from from my side to to hear about this. Um, I would like to bring in uh, one of the questions that we have been receiving while you were talking. It uh, appeared that just at the beginning, so I think it was mainly related to the first part of the conversation 
of um, of Pietro Modeo, and I will read it to you so that uh, you can that probably can trigger a, a discussion um, between the three of you. Uh, sometimes people say that crises are also a huge opportunity to develop a new knowledge, lessons learned. But uh, on the other hand, we all know that uh, we are all less rational than we seem. So is it possible to estimate the weight of pandemics and other human crisis tragedies on scientific progress? Are they really a push or just an illusion? I leave the answer to you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ariana, for the for the comments, and also to the anonymous person who asked uh, is the the question. Uh, I'd like to raise first a point in connection to what you said, Ariana. Um, the so to say the irony of the end of history. We've been told for years that we were at the end of history, and you know it was a shared feeling, you know, or sort of um, of common understanding uh, that certain processes were at the end, including uh, pandemics. Uh, and you know there is always a sort of of surprise effect when we re when history gets reactivated and we find ourselves again in the in the course of uh, of change that connects to the past but also leaves open. Um, open the future. So I think this is something we um, we can um, reflect on. As to the point of uh, the, the issue of crisis, before I pass the word to, to my colleagues, uh, I'd like to make two, uh, a couple of remarks um, on crisis and opportunity. Uh, first of all, I think we should um, we should find an agreement on what the, uh, the crisis exactly is. The crisis of, of what, so to say, or and the opportunity for whom? And these are the sort of questions. I, I don't want to be rhetoric, and so I can report on some positions that have emerged that I think are interesting. One is that of the Cal the Calcutta Collective I mentioned. Uh, they point to to three crises, for instance, that found found a moment of of synchronicity in, in our predicament. One is the, the biological crisis, the health crisis we are managing somehow. Um, the second one is, um, is the environmental one, and both are connected with the economic one. So uh, there, is, there is, so to say, also a crisis of the economic system we have been in you know, from various viewpoints. And the free circulation of people and goods is stuck by the pandemics on the one hand, and, if, uh, and at the same time, the, the productive growth uh, system we were in is facing one of the biggest crises ever, the environmental one. To think them together, that's uh, the difficulty. As to the problem of rationality, the other point raised by the, um, by, uh, the comment, I would just say briefly that science, regrettably, is not a guarantee of rationality. Um, it has played a fundamental role in modernity in order you know, to emancipate, to, uh, to, you know, to foster an enlightenment culture. But on the other hand, uh, I would say the shock of the 20th century has been precisely the shock of the idea of progress. The chemical warfare of the First World War, uh, the atomic bomb of the Second World War, and you know, the, the atomic proliferation uh, in the Cold War time, in the environmental crisis, these are three instances of of a deep crisis, if I can say so, of the confidence in the idea of uh, of progress that was so obvious in the 19th century. Perhaps Charles and Flavio want to add something to this. I don't know. It's up to you. So there were some questions in the. Um in the uh, box, but Flavio, do you want to say something else? Uh, maybe, maybe just a few words on the, um, just a few words on the, um, well, on what is scientific progress? Because it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting for me to to see and to and to highlight the scientific progress goes together with um, with environmental crisis and economic crisis and these two things are related together 
in, in, in history, I can give you an example about the first virus that was ever recognized because of a, of a technology of the electronic microscope, which was a virus called uh, affecting tab tobacco, and it was called tobacco mosaic virus. And interestingly, the, this virus emerged in plantations in, in South America, and exactly there, because the, the, there was intensive plantation of tobaccos. So this, this allowed the, the soil to degrade from its substances. And this was due to the colonial trade of tobacco itself. So you see that, uh, that there is from one side the, the crisis of, of this big um, global trade of tobacco. At the same time, there is the discovery of the first virus and so the advancement, te technological advancement. So it's, it's quite interesting and we can open other doors on the same specific issue of tobacco. For instance, WHO, it's, it's the, the first organization that tried to manage tobacco as a major health treat, but I will stop here. And I guess Charles, you, you, you have something to say about uh, the questions. Um, well, let me go, <clears throat> go back to them. So to uh, Corrado, I mean, Cor Corrado makes some very important points. And the first point, I assume people can see the, the text in the Q&A box. And the reference to biopolitics is only a rhetorical smokescreen that hides the conservative and Schmittian roots of his approach. So I, I disagree in the sense that I don't think it's a smokescreen. I think it's part of what you're calling the, the Schmittian uh, dimension, which is to say to denounce the banality, according to him, not according to me, to denounce the sort of weakness or banality of democratic structures and norms in the name of something else. So if you are a Schmidt, it's in the name of some you know, perhaps some terrible thing, but there is a sort of cynicism about modern liberal democracies, which Schmidt has a powerful critique of, which is why there is such a thing as left-wing Schmittianism, because some people like Negri can take that critique and say, I don't want to turn this into a destruction of justice. I want to turn it into sort of further emancipation. But that's a, you know, a longer answer than what you asked. So when Agamben has this biopolitics, it is again this idea that there is something deeper and more authentic, so-called bare life, which governments seek to manage and which modern Western society in general is just controlling. So I don't think there's smoke screens. I think there's one thing. And for the second point, as I wrote, I completely agree. Either he misunderstands or he deliberately misunderstands. He takes what is historical, genealogical, socially nuanced, and he turns it into a kind of messianic narrative, which is why I used the Benjamin quote, which uh, Roberta asks about in her question. And uh, that quote, I think, expresses what I would call enlightenment values, which is to say someone saying, if we put a, a kind of biopolitics above everything else, there is a certain messianism, mysticism still there. But I think there are different possible usages of the quote, but I think I wrote schematically the, the two options, and I prefer the sort of secularizing, you know, a secularization idea of reading, a uh, way of reading the quote, but um, just like the Schmittian element has the sort of dark side, but can be appropriated by a certain kind of leftist critique of democracy. There's something similar about the Benjamin quote. So, thanks. And
Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few other questions. Um, we have a question for Pietro, and that is, uh, could part of emancipated science and technology also be the idea that experts should appreciate their role as political and not just purely scientific, at least in times of crisis? Yes, I fully agree. Uh, that's uh, part of the point. I fully agree. This is a. That's why I spoke about scientists and experts as intellectuals to stress the the cultural meaning of science and technology. Uh, in the cultural meaning also um, uh, the, the contact with broader broader societal needs and not um, pure uh, ones. For, you know the pure ones of disinterested science or the technical ones of a technology that is uh, neutrally at the service of its uh, its uses. But I think it also refers to another aspect that is not often uh, reflected enough. I mean, on one hand, we could ask who are the intellectuals? Uh, and also, who are the scientists or better said, who is who are those who belong to the scientific community? You know, there is this internality externality issue always um, always uh, going on and we can say also that with science technology knowledge uh, it's um, it's not you know a clear-cut um, border that we can draw from you know the inner circle of the expert and the external circle of society there is a lot of continuity and contiguity and in shades is a professor at or a, teach, a teacher at school an intellectual the scientist uh, intellectual to be sure, but also somebody who shares the scientific culture of our society and also carries part of the responsibility for the the, um, the scientific knowledge that we share and, and circulate. So I think we also have to, to think who are the scientists. You know? I speak also as an historian of science, um, somebody who, who got trained to work on big names, and I still work on the big names, Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, you know, uh, Einstein and so on, Pasteur, I mean, we heard also the, the, the heroes of, of medical history. Um, but the point is that the scientific community is much more than the, the, the Nobel Prize winners and, you know, the, the, the big names or the big, so to say, geniuses, as it were, of, of history. They are part of a larger community and the larger community is very important to be addressed uh, in order to, to think of what a, a free science or emancipated so, uh, science uh, could be because the the way in which the scientific relations are built among the scientists and in the society at large this is one of the questions that uh, that concern us all being uh, living in this social technological world we are in thank you Thank you, thank you very much, Pietro. Indeed, uh, this is very uh, interesting, especially if we make a parallel with the ongoing things where we we can see every day, all of us are seeing doctors speaking in the media and, and making politics, although they uh, they claim not being doing it, but uh, at the end of the day, it is exactly what is happening in some cases. So it is uh, your, your, your thoughts about it were extremely interesting. Um, I think that we do not have any other questions specific. We have a little bit of remarks and answer to the previous uh, questions. So I would like um, uh, to ask uh, if any of our speaker has any other uh, comment that uh, would like to express. And uh, well, then uh, I think that we can uh, we can stop here. And um, I would like to thank our speakers, our speakers of today. Thank you for your time and your interesting thoughts. Thank you also to all connected that uh, are um, have been uh, participating to this uh, webinar. I would like uh, to thank also the organizers. So 
Silvia from the IIT alumni office and all involved uh, from the side also of our speakers because as we have seen they didn't participate directly but they have been participating in preparing the topic of this conversation today. So again uh, many thanks to all of you and have a good day. And uh, thank you too, Ariana. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for organizing this. And don't uh, refer and don't hesitate to write to us if you have, uh, you know, later questions that can <laughs> come to your mind at a later point. So we'll, we'll be the three of us and the rest of the group will be more than happy to uh, to answer. And also wish to see you in person in post-COVID times, <laughs> in order to to see also the public in in face. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this. And I will ask the IIT alumni office po possibly to give around your uh, your bios and your again and your um, your emails so that if anybody is interested to ask new questions after today, uh, they can uh, they can do it and contact you anytime. OK, thanks so much to everybody again and see you next time.